Okay, so today we will be in Psalm 51, all right? And before we read that psalm, I'm going to tell you about, Psalm 51 is about the concept of salvation. And when I say that word salvation, what do you think of, what comes to mind, how do you imagine salvation? How do you picture salvation? And it's a word we use a lot, right? We use it a lot in our church culture, um, but it has to mean something to you, and I want you to think about that, and while you're thinking about that, minimize that in the back of your mind, I'm going to tell you a, a little story about when we were, when we, before we came to the field, we were living in Texas, and our church would have Wednesday night prayer meetings, and at these Wednesday night prayer meetings, well, our kids were really little like this, we were still having babies, and they were little, and it was hard to get there on Wednesday nights, but one thing I liked about Wednesday night at our church was, it was the older crowd that came, like, I would say older, talking World War II, World War I crowd people, like, it was really neat to hear their stories, and hear the, their, you know, just their life stories they shared with us, and I struck up a friendship with this guy, he was born in 1911, Bradford Ramsey, and uh, one of the stories he used to tell, uh, when he was a boy, there was no cars, there was no roads, and his dad was a, a circuit preacher or itinerant preacher, and in the South at that time, preachers would travel and just preach in different towns, and they would go from Alabama to Texas. And um, he spent his time in the back of a wagon, and to pass the time, he said he had a corn cob tied to a string that he would just like drag in the sand as the wagon just rolled on down the road. And one of the times they were going to a town, it stopped, and night was falling, he stopped, the wagon stopped, he got out, and he saw his dad kneel down beside the wagon and pray. And he realized that the road forked into two ways. There's no road signs, there's no way to know anything is the word to go. And so, Bradford told that story about how the Lord provided for his family and how that impacted, how that was part of his life growing up. And you listen to these stories from these people in that generation, and you start to realize things like salvation even have a greater, deeper meaning than possible to us today. We, we tend to probably compartmentalize that word. Um, I don't know about you. I can't speak for you. But a lot of times we hear salvation and we think spiritual. I got saved at a youth camp. I got saved, and it's a very spiritual thing. Um, but if you talk to Bradford Ramsey about his experience with the Lord, it's going to encompass the fact that the Lord provided for him physically and provided for his family and saved his family from danger when he was growing up. So today we're going to read a psalm from David that has a similar idea to me. Like He talks about the salvation of the Lord, and his, his request is that the Lord would restore the joy of his salvation in particular. So he doesn't ask, that his salvation would be restored, but the joy of his salvation, okay? So I'm going to read it to you, um, and then we're going to talk about um, talk about it. So Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the inward part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me. From the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. 
For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, will you not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Okay, so some of that language is a little a little strange to us, maybe, but a lot of it is actually strangely very similar to our New Testament concepts and the words we use, the Holy Spirit he uses, right? Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, um, for instance. So what I'm going to propose is this. As we look at these three sections, I, bro I broke this into three sections. I'm going to propose this, that David, what he's really asking in all of the psalm, he has one main request, and that really that main request is that the Lord restores to him the joy of the salvation. And everything else that he asks is part of that request. Right? You'll see what I mean as we go along. So let's look at okay, so the first um, verses verses one through nine talk about sin, right? In particular, this is written, this psalm is a famous psalm, you probably recognized it, and it's written, it's, it's related to the fact that David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and arranged the murder or the death of Uriah, her, his, her husband. So this psalm was written in reflection of all those events that occurred, and after Nathan had told him what was going to happen as a result of, of these things. So the first thing you want to notice here in this idea of our salvation is the sin that David recognizes. So first he recognizes he has sinned. Um, in each of these cases, we can look to the New Testament to correspond and support these same ideas, right? So David says, I have sinned, and he confesses his sin, right? And one thing you notice as you read this is that he's not only confessing his sin, he's confessing his hopelessness in his sin. So when he talks about the fact that he was born in this sinful or this iniquity, he's born this way. You may, it may sound similar to us, like this could sound like an excuse. Maybe someone says, well, I'm an alcoholic because I was born this way. Or you've heard these types of excuses, right? But David is saying it as, an, as a recognition, as an admission. I realize now, I realize this is part of who I am. I... <laughs> I have sin interwoven into my DNA that I am not able to control it. No matter how hard I try, I have this sin, sinful nature. Now, in your discussions and your conversations with Turks, you know this is an interesting thing to have, and I and I recommend that you do go there with your Turkish friends and ask them about what they think about sin and their sinful nature. Because one is they won't be challenged anywhere else. No one else is going to challenge them about it. And simply by asking them, it causes them to think about it, right? And you, and here's what here's a general response that I have found. Um, Gokhan Abi, who comes to our Dernik, they, they really have a hard time understanding that a child is a sinner. <coughs> because they're defining sin the way they want to, not by how Scripture defines it, right? So what it, Gokhan says is, well, what you're saying is a child has the potential to sin. He's not a sinner. And I said, no. Scripture is very clear that we are born with a sinful nature. Even though that child hasn't acted out in a physical way, he's still a sinner because of who, how we are and how we are, um, how we receive, it's called the federal headship from Adam. So by sin, by one man, sin entered the world and passed through us. But we have this sinful nature um, Romans 7, 19 to 25, read that real quickly. It ex explains this. Paul talks about this, Romans 9, uh, I'm sorry, 7. Seven verses, um, 19 to 25. 
For the good that I will to do, I do not, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the, to the law of sin, which is in my, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here you have the same idea that David is talking about that Paul reinforces. He's born in sin and he has this, this sinful problem. Now, you notice that David asks for everything to be done from the outward way. Cleanse me, O Lord. He says, cleanse me, wash me, forgive me, blot out my sins. These are all things that the Lord must do for him, right? Um, that's very important and that's also corroborated in the New Testament. We find that forgiveness comes from without, not from within. We cannot provide our own sanctification or, or righteousness so that we can achieve any sort of forgiveness on our own. So David is, first of all, recognizing he sinned. He's recognizing he needs forgiveness. He needs help with this sinful person that he... Um, <coughs> Another point in here is that he, you notice he says that I have sinned, oh, let me get back here, Psalm 51, against you and you alone. Did you notice that? You might find that interesting since he sinned against, we would say, Uriah and Bathsheba both, right? Um, let's see, against you. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and have done this evil in your sight. So I'm going to point you to scripture to help us understand this. So that does sound weird to us. Now, if you look at Genesis 39.9 about Joseph, you might remember that Joseph said the same exact thing. When he was tempted with Potiphar, by Potiphar's wife, she came to him and he said, How can I do this thing and sin against God? Right? So... We see the same concept there in the Joseph, but in Leviticus, actually, Leviticus gives us a code and a definition for sin that shows us that it is against all sin is against God. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 2 says, If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord, against the Lord by lying to his neighbor, and it goes on to list more sin. But the point is this, Leviticus tells us what sin is. If a person sins and commits trespass against the God, against the Lord, by such and such and such. So we're told in Leviticus right up front that all sin is against God. Right? So this is a good reminder, and David is pointing us um, in the right direction as he talks about his sin, his, uh, his need for forgiveness from without. Right? God has to be the one to forgive him. And then he asks for help with this sinful condition. He's hopeless, and he knows it. Now, number two is, in verse 10, he asks that God would create in him, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Again, you might hear the allusion to the new covenant, right? Um, in Jeremiah 31, 33, it says, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Right? And I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is the allusion to the new covenant um, in which God's going to give us or give his people um, the laws in, his, in our minds and in our hearts. So what is the heart? What is your heart? And it's interesting to talk about our heart. In Turkish culture, and I, and I assume, you know, it's probably this way across all cultures, but we talk about, or we have a word for heart, our physical heart, but we also use the word as an emotional thing we love somebody loves something with all their heart um, that translates really easy between English and Turkish um, we don't have a problem with that at all um, but what is your heart have you ever thought about that very much it's used a lot in scripture to talk about loving the Lord our God with all of our heart um, but it's a little bit difficult to define 
Um, one definition I like is that it is the seat of the emotion. So our desires come out of this, what we call our heart. Whatever we have these desires for, our heart is the engine behind that. So, Jesus, for, so David is saying, create in me a new motor, an engine that creates these desires. I don't know if you've ever had an engine or a car that had an engine that blew up on you and you had to get a new engine put in. Has anyone ever had that experience? You had a blown motor? Yeah. So when you blow a motor in a car and you put a brand new engine in it, right? The car usually gets better performance, you know, maybe sometimes you improve the engine because you put a better engine in it, right? If you don't have an engine for the car, you're not going to be able to do much at all, right? So you've got, our heart is very similar in the sense that it is the, it's the motor and the engine where the desires come from. And so um, there are many verses in the New Testament that talk about our hearts being hardened or our hearts being far from the Lord. And it's like the idea of like making your kids like broccoli or something. Like, I want you to eat that. What is it? I don't know. What do the kids not like? Cucumbers. Cucumbers? You can't make them love it. Like, you just can't make them. You can probably make them eat it, but you can't. Say, I want you to love that. Well, I can't do that. But, but David here is recognizing something. He's like, create in me, if you create in me a new heart, that's going to solve a lot of these problems, right? Because I have selfish desires, and I have these impulses, and I have these <coughs> things I want to do really badly, but they're all the wrong way. So I'm in a new engine. I need a new heart that's going to be in line with you. Um, also, we see in the New Testament the same idea. Second Corinthians 3 says, uh, You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, not with ink, but with the Spirit. Um, the Spirit um, of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. That's from the New Testament. So the New Testament idea is very much the same way, that we receive a new heart. God speaks to our heart. We have a heart, you know, not in this emotional, not in this kind of poetic sense, but actually our, it's the engine, the seat of our desires, becomes affected by God, right? Verse 11 and 12, he gets to the main crux of the his request here, and he says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And I think really right here is really where the meat of this whole chapter is coming from. And I really challenge you to think about the presence of God in your life. This is, this is where I think we're getting to the... the to the heart of what, it, what salvation really means. If you read or think about the famous Psalms that David wrote, like Psalm 23, you remember he says, the Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. It's pretty famous. It's a little strange to imagine what that looks like, but it starts to give you a little clue as to how David views the Lord's presence as part of his life that has given him victory. The Lord is preparing a table. The Lord is with me. If the Lord is with me, what harm can come to me? This is how David views it. Now, do you remember also when David went out to fight Goliath? Right? We've all heard that one, right? So you remember what he said. Why? They tried to give him the armor. They tried to give him the weapons. And what did he say? He said, the Lord has delivered me from the lion and the bear and he'll deliver me from this giant. And we always usually and we usually go, wow, look at how humble David was. Look at David. And it's totally missing the point. We're not supposed to go, wow, look at David. We're supposed to go, wow, look at the Lord. Why do we go to David and say, wow, what a humble guy. He's not humble. He's telling the truth. And David's understanding when the Lord is with him, these great things happen. The Lord's presence enables you know, the beast, when he's out being a shepherd boy, he, the Lord's presence protected him from the beast. If you drive a car from here across to Asia and you're able to get there in 20 minutes, we don't say, wow, what a great, you're so, I'm saying you can really drive, you're, you're, no, it's not you, it's the car. The car drove you there, right? You didn't run over there. If you ran over there, it would be different, right? 
but the car got you there. And we don't say, I'm saying you're so humble because you gave credit to the car that got you, right? The car got you there, but you're just being honest and relaying the fact that the car got you there. And David's doing the same thing. Like, the Lord was with me. His presence enabled all these, these great things to happen. So I was thinking about this. You know, if you think about a triangle, like, here's David at this bottom of the corner of the triangle. And, like, for some reason, we like to think of God up here, which, let's say, for sake of argument, we think of God up here. And then we have these things around us at this other end of the we have these forces, opposing forces. There's a Goliath or something here. And we can pray to God and he'll take care of that for us. But this is not what David sees. David sees the presence of the Lord with him. And if you read his psalms, you see this comes out in all of his psalms, that the presence of the Lord is the reason why all these things happen. It's the presence of the Lord. Don't take your presence away. From, cast me not away from your presence. If I'm in your presence, good things happen. Uh, in the presence of the Lord is like a thousand, you know, um, years. I can't remember exactly what he says, but these sort of psalms, he's always talking about the presence of the Lord is the key uh, to his success, to his survival. Um, the let's see. In the New Testament, we look at this as the presence of the Lord coming with, um, primarily with the coming of. The Holy Spirit, when we read about Pentecost, when, when God sent His Holy Spirit to dwell with His believers, and we, when we read in the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all people, but the end of that is actually very, very important, and we tend to kind of forget about that part, that I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And that promise is something that, that David would have really taken seriously, and I, and I think we speaking for myself, tend to not think about that so much. That I am with you always. The presence of the Lord is with us. Um, one, other, one other thought on that. Um, I just finished a book by Ian Bounds, and if you've ever heard of Ian Bounds, he's famous for writing about prayer. And one of the things that he, he, just, he just keeps harping on and emphasizing is this idea that we need to hold on to God, even though he's holding us. And it's the, the idea that we need to um, latch on like Jacob. When Jacob, you remember the story where the angel of the Lord came and wrestled with Jacob, and he would not let him go until the morning. It's a fascinating story to, and to try and think about that idea. But he wouldn't let him go until he blessed him. And Ian Bounds really latches onto this, and all of his writings is, is about this in our prayer. Our prayers need to be this idea of latching onto God. Even though he's, he's holding us, we got to latch on with the tenacity of Jacob. Uh, and eventually he blessed him and said, you know, you have wrestled with God and man and prevailed. Um, but it's the presence of the Lord that we should latch onto. I had one story to tell, and... Okay, hopefully it'll help, but it's also a good story to tell about me and Audrey. But when Audrey was little, um, she was maybe five or six, and we were riding horses up in, <coughs> out in a village outside of Izmir, where we lived. So we went up there to ride horses. We were all riding horses. I think Elijah was on your lap, though. Elijah was too little. You had so we were all on horses, and Audrey was on a horse. She's like five or six. And we come back from our little... Um, horse ride, we come back, and all of a sudden, Audrey's horse just bolts for some reason. Her horse takes off, and she's too little. She's like, I'm like, we're pulling all the reins, and she's like trying to, you know, ah, and she can't really, she's not strong enough, she's kind of bouncing around, and I'm just like, the father in me, bang, I'm off, I'm on my horse, here we go, and I'm like, I'm actually chasing her on this horse, and I'm going, and I... <laughs> I get up beside her, and she's like, I'm holding on to and I just get up beside her, and I grabbed her, right? So I'm beside her, and she grabs hold of me, and I got her on my horse, and then we stopped, and I'm like, this is just like a cowboy movie. I just did a cowboy rescue. Um, but what I thought of in that example was I had her, like, okay, I've got her. She's small enough that I can tear. If she didn't let go of the reins, I'm still going to get her, but she... She latched onto me. We latched onto each other. But the idea is the presence of God in our life 
We need to value it so much. And David, all the time, is talking about the presence of God. And he didn't have the promise of the presence of God that we even have on this side of the cross, that we have the promises of God with us and his spirit with us. And, and we just don't latch on. We just don't, we're not tenacious enough. Um, and that, that book I read by Ian Bounds really did help me, convict me about that in my life. Um, so finally, there's one more aspect. So we talked about the sin, the sin to be confessed and to be forgiven and the help from our sinful state. And then we talked about the, um, the need for a new heart in our salvation. And then we talked about the presence of God. So there's one more aspect that we didn't talk about yet. And this is the final aspect. And it's not, it is there, but you may not see it. And I didn't see it at first. But it's the aspect of the penal substitution. Penal substitution means something, somebody has to pay for the sin. You can't, God can never just say, you know what, David, I feel really sorry for you. Sin's forgiven. Never does that. There is, has to be an atonement for our sin. So in the last part of this, uh, 16 to 19, Okay, 16 and 19 says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Okay, so that may sound like a double talk. That may sound a little bit like you just said God doesn't want to sacrifice, and then you say, well, there's going to be the sacrifices. Well, what's happening? And so I looked into this, and what's happening is this. Um, in verse 16, he's talking about it's true that God required a sacrifice for certain things, and it's very specific. You read Leviticus this sacrifice was for this sin. This, this sacrifice for this transgression. And that's very important. And then he said this. The Lord doesn't require, or he doesn't want the sacrifice, but he requires it. What he wants is a broken and contrite spirit. This shows up again in Hosea and other places in the Bible. That it is true. The Lord is not after the killing of the animal in itself. What the Lord is after is the brokenness that goes with that. The brokenness so that we recognize there has to be a major payment for that sin. That's what the Lord is after. The broken heart, the broken contrite spirit that comes with a sacrifice of giving up something, a giving up of a life to pay for that, right? Which ultimately points us to Jesus. But here's the thing. Now, why does he say this? Um, the burnt offering, you will be pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness with burnt offering and the whole burnt offering. And I looked this up. What the whole burnt offering was, the burnt offering was the one offering that allows presence, physical presence to God. It's interesting. That's the one offering. If you look it up in Leviticus, it explains the burnt offering was done before the priest could go into God. That's the purpose of the burnt offering. It didn't, it wasn't for a specific sin. It was so the presence of God physically could be, could, could happen. Without the burnt offering, there's no going into the presence of God. So what David is saying here, when he talks about the burnt offering, we're going to be together. We're, there's going to be this presence together. And if you read it in the, in the language of the Old Testament, you know, this idea of the walls of Jerusalem, it's very similar to the echo in, G, in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jerusalem was the promised, the city of God, where God was going to set up his kingdom it's very similar to the idea that God's kingdom will reign. You build your walls and you build your kingdom and we'll have this presence forever, you and with your people. That's the idea of the burnt offering. And that's what David is saying in this language, just a little older, the Old Testament language. So we don't really recognize that because we're not familiar with the sacrifices and what they mean. But So to recap, this whole psalm, Psalm 51, when we read it, we do connect with it. We connect with a lot of these terms because we, we understand uh, how they relate to the New Testament. 
first of all, there's the confession of sin. First of all, and then there's the forgiveness of sin that David asked for and the recognition that we need help from our sinful condition in order for the, for the restoration of the joy of his salvation. Secondly, he asked for a new heart so that his desires will be in line with the Lord. Thirdly, the presence of God, he asked, do not cast me away from your presence. And this is maybe the biggest, most passionate part of David's. When you look at all of the Psalms that he wrote, it's such a big part of his desire that he experience the presence of the Lord and that he not be removed from his presence. Um, and lastly, um, the recognition of when he refers to the burnt offering, that there has been a sacrifice made to atone for, for all the sins, that God did never just, just waved all the sins away, that there was a sacrifice made um, for our sins in Jesus Christ. So I hope that was helpful for you today. As you think about as you think about how you define salvation, how you think about your own salvation, um, hopefully that some of these things we talked about that David wrote in the Psalm 51 will, will help you as you continue to, to think about your salvation. And, and I pray, I don't know where you are exactly, but maybe like David, you would like that same request, like restore to me the joy of my salvation. And thinking over these things and praying through these things and recognizing the value that we have, for instance, say, the presence of the Lord in our life. I pray that that will help you. Um, amen. Well, let's pray, and I'll be done. Lord, thank you for thank you for this passage. Thank you for, for our salvation that we have in you. Thank you that it's something um, bigger than we even appreciate most of the time, but yet we do have the guarantee and the, the um, ability to come into your presence and the ability to know that we are in right standing with you because of the work that Jesus did for us. We are so thankful for that, and I pray that you would just help us to understand more about what that means. Um, we thank you and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.